Anne Marie, go ahead. Dr. Nathan, go ahead. Okay. Hello, and welcome to this evening's Power Hour webinar brought to you by the ACR's RLI titled Vision Beyond the Reading Room, The Radiologist's Role in Health Equity. My name is Dr. Jennifer Nathan, and I co-chair the ACR's RLI Power Hour webinar series with Dr. Bob Pyatt. Before we get started, there's just a few items that we want to go over with you so that you know how to better participate in this evening's event. So when you join this evening, you join through the Zoom platform. At the very bottom of your screen, you will see what we call the Zoom control panel, which is shown here as this black box. There are two icons in particular that I want to draw your attention to. The first is the chat icon. When you click on the chat icon, this is what you're going to use for technical support. So if you're having a technical issue, click on the chat icon, up comes the chat window, type in your concern, hit send, and our staff will then see it on our end and we'll get in touch with you how, on how to resolve your technical issue. The second icon I wanna draw your attention to is the Q&A. When you click on this, up comes the Q&A window where you can type in questions that you wanna ask of our faculty. Type in your question and hit send and we'll then see it on our end. You can type in a question at any point and hit submit throughout the webinar. However, they, the questions will only be collected and will not be officially addressed until we get to the Q&A session, which will happen at the very end. One other item that we do want to bring to your attention is that this is a recorded webinar, which will be available to our membership at a later date. That also includes the Q&A session, so all participant questions will become part of that recorded webinar. So I would now like to turn things over to Dr. Pyatt to introduce today's faculty. Dr. Pyatt. Thank you, Jen. We have quite a distinguished faculty this evening, and we're going to start off with Jackie Bellow, MDFACR. Jackie completed her medical school residency in neuroradiology fellowships at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, and the Neurological Institute. She is a past president of both the New York Rentgen Society and the New York State Radiological Society. And she is a fellow of the New York Academy of Medicine and the ACR. As the first radiologist to be elected president of the Montefiore medical staff, she served in that role from 2012 to 2016. She is also the third past president of the ASNR and represents the ASNR in the AMA House of Delegates. Jackie is a professor of radiology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, and she is the director of neuroradiology for Montefiore Medical Center and Health System. She currently serves as vice chair of the ACR Board of Chancellors. Geraldine McGinty, MD, MBA, FACR, did her medical training in Ireland at the National University and then came to the USA to do her residency at the University of Pittsburgh, where she was chief resident. Her fellowship was in women's imaging at Massachusetts General Hospital. While working at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, she completed an MBA at Columbia University. Geraldine serves as a non-executive director of IDA Ireland, the National Foreign Direct Investment Agency, and she also serves on the board of Agamon, a healthcare technology startup. She serves, uh, she also um, has been the past president of the ACR and the board, chair of the board of chancellors of the ACR and Geraldine has 14,000 followers on Twitter. <laughs> Our third speaker, Gail Morgan, MDFACR, serves as chair of the committee for diversity and inclusion as part of the commission for women and diversity. She developed the first ACR chapter diversity committee and she wrote the blueprint leading to the creation of 31 national chapter diversity committees to date. She is also a past president of the Washington State Radiological Society, and she was elected ACR counselor for the state for two terms. In 2018, she received the chapter's prestigious gold medal for her lifetime achievement, notably the first woman to receive the award. Previously a diagnostic radiologist at Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle, Washington, with specialty areas in breast imaging and ultrasound, she trained many radiology residents and technologists over her career as head of the radiology residency, ultrasound and breast imaging training programs. She recently retired and now lives with her family in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Janelle Scott, MD, MBA, is an associate professor of clinical radiology at Sunny Downstate Health Sciences University. She is also the director of emergency radiology and the Director of Quality and Patient Safety in the Department of Radiology, New York City Health and Hospitals, Kings County. 
Dr. Scott has dedicated her career to ensuring that safety net hospitals provide high quality imaging services to the marginalized and stigmatized communities they serve whose health outcomes are heavily impacted by the effects of poverty, racism, and prejudice. She believes that robust patient-centered quality and safety programs are integral to their survival. And we also have Josh Hirsch, MD, FACR. Josh will be the moderator here this evening. He is an interventional neuroradiologist at MGH, and he is the vice chair of procedural services, among his many other designations, and his academic appointment is at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Hirsch is a past president of both the American Society of Spine Radiology, the Society of Neurointerventional Radiology, and more recently, the American Society of Neuroradiology. He has been recognized with many awards, including those for academic achievement, patient advocacy, mentoring, and even one for transformational leadership. He has published over 600 papers in academic journals. Dr. Hirsch also currently chairs the Future Trends Committee of the Economics Commission of the ACR. It's a pleasure to have these wonderful faculty with us tonight, and we'll now turn the program over to start with Dr. McGinty. Thank you so much, Bob, uh, for the, that kind introduction for me, and, and I'm really honored to be uh, on tonight's webinar with such distinguished co-panelists. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks brief because I, I've seen some of the great content you're about to see, and I've seen your questions, and I know we want to get to as many of them as possible. I was so honored to launch our Radiology Health Equity Coalition as part of my president's speech um, at, during the ACR annual meeting. But I want to make a couple of things clear. This is not an ACR effort. It is truly a community-wide coalition, which is why I'm so glad we have Dr. Scott with us, who's the RSNA representative to, that, uh, to the, the mobilization task force. It is also something that builds on the foundational work of so many in radiology, including a number of our panelists tonight, um, people who have worked in health equity for many, many years, you know, we are truly standing on, the, on their shoulders. There are a couple of concerns that I, I'm sure we will work through tonight. Um, you know, I think it's, it's easy for radiologists to perhaps think that, radio, that health equity is not in our lane, that that's something that public health does. And I, I think you'll hear tonight there are unique opportunities for radiologists to make a difference. And then, of course, in our fairly toxic political climate, there's a concern that perhaps this is out of the scope of what we should be doing as a professional society and professional community. But this, to me, really speaks to the heart of who we are as physicians. It's about quality. And the quote that I always go back to from our imaging 3.0 days, providing all of the imaging that's beneficial and necessary and none that is not. And that's from my mentor, um, Bill Allen. And we know there's a business case for a healthier population. So I'm excited to hear tonight about what we as a radiology community can do to make sure that all of our patients get the benefit of what we know imaging can do to make them healthier and save lives. Thank you. And I think I'm turning it over to Dr. Scott now. <laughs> Thank you so much to the ACR and to the Radiology Leadership Institute for hosting this very important um, panel discussion. I would also like to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Stephen Waite, who is the primary author on a paper published earlier this year in radiology, um, entitled Narrowing the Gap, Imaging Disparities in Radiology. I would encourage everyone to read this paper if you have not done so already. Um, I very brief presentation today draws on themes from this paper, and we will take a critical look at the role radiology plays in perpetuating health disparities. So for today, I would like to describe the patient provider and systemic factors that perpetuate disparities in radiology. I would like to highlight how imaging disparities lead to poorer outcomes in minority communities. And finally, describe the patient provider and systemic level interventions that could potentially decrease disparities in imaging. So, um, you know, Stalin once said that one death is a tragedy, but millions of deaths is a statistic. So today I want to really humanize the impact of racial inequities in healthcare um, and, and, and take our vision as radiologists collectively from the reading room and focus it on the patient whose lives we impact every day, even though many of us don't interact with them directly. I want to tell the story behind the numbers and really highlight the cost of disparities, the very real cost of disparities to patients and their families. 
as radiologists and as a radiology community, we need to understand that we do play a role in perpetuating inequities and that we can also play a role in addressing these inequities, particularly as we seek as a profession to be more patient-centered and just in how we deliver care. So I want to introduce you to Abina. She's 40 years old. She's happily married to her husband of 10 years. Um, they have two beautiful children. She works part-time as an administrative assistant and she goes to school um, after hours at night to um, complete her undergraduate degree. Before we get deep into Abina's story, I want us to review the Institute of Medicine's framework for understanding racial um, inequities. According to this framework, these inequities are the result of patient, provider, and system-related factors. So some examples of patient-related um, factors would include language barriers, medical mistrust, cultural differences, health literacy, health insurance. Um, some provider-related factors would include ordering practices, implicit bias, expertise availability, or knowledge of advanced imaging. Um, and system-related factors would include technological diffusion or the rate at which um, new techniques and equipment and technologies are adopted into systems of care, quality measures, resources, and diagnostic algorithms. So all, you know, facets of all of these, um, these factors can come together to produce poor outcomes in marginalized communities. But we also must remember that this is occurring in a framework or in a system, uh, an environment of racism. In November 2020, the American Medical Association um, identified racism as a significant public health risk. I would like to quote one board member by saying, the AMA recognizes that racism negatively impacts and exacerbates health inequities among historically marginalized communities. Without systemic and structural level change, health inequities will continue to exist and the overall health of the nation will suffer. So we can no longer ignore the impact of racism on the health and well-being of our patients and our patients' communities. Um, uh, Dr. David Williams in one of his papers said that racism is insidious and its structure and ideology can persist in governmental and institutional policies in the absence of individual actors who are racially prejudiced. So in the medical community and in radiology specifically, we need to normalize speaking about racism. It's uncomfortable, but ignoring this topic is actually harmful. So let's push past the discomfort and get into that zone of learning for the benefit of our community and our patients. So we're gonna walk Abina through the imaging cycle as she gets the mammogram. So Abina gets her care in a hospital in her community. She likes going there because it's convenient. The people there treat her with respect and several of the people who work in the hospital actually live in her community. She, you know, she gets to the, the, the clinic and it's overcrowded and she ends up spending about two hours before she's actually seen by, by a provider. By the time she gets to the, pro the provider, she's flustered because she needs to get on with her day. She has to pick her kids up from school. So she's very anxious to get through this physical exam very quickly. Dr. Williams, on the other hand, is extremely busy. His patient load just increased dramatically due to staff to no recent staff to Nova. In addition, he's kind of confused about the current recommendations on breast imaging. In the past, he would recommend that his patients starting at the age of 40 and every year get an annual mammogram. But he, re he read recently that the United States Preventative Services Task Force changed those recommendations and said that patients should actually start at the age of 50 and get it every other year. So in his, you know, because he's so busy and he's confused, he neglects to inform and to educate Abina on the, on the importance of getting an annual mammogram. So two years go by and she's back at the clinic and this time they recommend that she gets the mammogram. She goes to get her mammogram and has to wait about two hours because of staff shortages, someone called out and also one of the machines is down. She doesn't even understand why she really needs it. She feels fine, she's not in pain and no one in her family has breast cancer. And in addition, she's very concerned about the hours that she's missing at work. She really needs to get to work and she, gets, or she only gets paid if she works. Um, the technologist tried, but she's new and she asked you know, Abina to kind of be patient with her and Abina was not prepared for how painful the exam was going to be. Dr. Rogers is a general radiologist, but he's been reading mammograms for several years. Um, he's concerned because Abina's breasts appear quite dense um, and he's not very you know, comfortable or very happy with the technique. So he wants Abina to come back for repeat imaging and possible ultrasound. Abina, they send a letter to her, but they never call her. So when Abina gets the letter, she's confused. She's not seeing any, any sign. They didn't say that she had cancer. And again, she feels fine. 
she's really concerned about getting to work and she can't afford to miss any work. So she decides that she will deal with it later. Two years have gone by and things are doing great for with Abina. She has graduated. She's so excited to start her new career. Um, and with all the business of work and school and taking care of her family, she never went back for those follow-up images that were requested. And in addition to that, she never even went back to the clinic for even a routine um, follow-up visit. Um, she's happy, but she can't, you know, she, she hasn't been feeling quite herself lately. She has this really dull pain in her back and she has this pain under her arm, a kind of lump that she thought was related to a cold that she just had, but it's not going down, it's actually getting bigger. So she decides to go back to the clinic to just check herself out. And unfortunately, that she's diagnosed eventually with metastatic breast cancer. Perhaps nowhere, no other um, subspecialty in radiology has inequities within groups been studied as much as in women's imaging. Compared with white women, black women have a decreased incidence of breast cancer, but they have significantly increased mortality. In fact, breast cancer death rates are 40% higher for black women as compared to white women. And this may be due to biological differences in, in the aggressiveness of tumors. Tumors in black women tend to be more biologically aggressive. And it also may be due to the fact that black women tend to get diagnosed later in their, in their disease. But even accounting for these differences, there is still a racial difference in, survive, in, in survival. And that indicates that there's some social factors that are also driving these disparities such as cultural beliefs or even access to care. So I think we're all familiar with this reasons model for, um, we use it in healthcare to sort of understand how um, patient safety events occur, but I think it's apt that we apply to this um, particular scenario. So Abina gets to care at a safety net hospital. Safety net hospitals disproportionately serve minority and low income communities that face financial and cultural barriers to healthcare. Unfortunately, these hospitals are more likely to rank poorly on quality measures, and they're often associated with poorer outcomes due to factors such as financial strain, you know, hospital resource constraints. These hospitals tend to be in communities with overall worse um, population health, and there's several reasons for that, which we definitely cannot get into today. Um, and also, these patients from these communities tend to present with more advanced disease. Waiting. Abina had to wait such a long, every, at every point in the imaging cycle, she had to wait. Clinic times are longer for racial and ethnic minorities. And it's not because they're seeing, you know, the doctors a longer time, they're spending more time with the doctors. It's actually because they're doing other activities, such as completing paperwork, interacting with nurses and clerical staff, and also waiting. Patients literally bear the weight of the, or the burden of the inefficiencies in the system. And a significant portion of patients can't afford to miss work. So they're forced to make a decision between their health and their income. And if they're young and they feel fine, they most likely will choose their income. In addition, there's underuse in general of um, screening mammography among black women, and this contributes to racial disparities and outcomes and mortality. Black women utilize screening mammography at lower rates, and this is partly due to lack of physician recommendations. In fact, black women are less likely to report that a doctor recommended that they get or a provider recommended that they get um, screening mammography as compared to white women. And this is a really important fact because physician recommendation accounts for 60 to 75% of the racial differences in mammography use. And of course, as we, saw, as we saw in our scenario, there is this ambiguity with the current recommendations. The United States Preventative Service Task Force um, has, have, has had a significant change in their recommendations. And we can see that, you know, patients with all this ambiguity, the patients could fall through the cracks. Minority patients tend to frequent institutions that, uh, that are challenged with recruiting and retaining skilled technologists and in adopting advanced technology. There's one study that looked at um, urban residents with breast cancer. They studied these um, mammograms looking for markers of, of, of quality such as compression, um, image sharpness and, um, and positioning. And they found that it did vary with socioeconomic factors. They noted that patients with lower, um, from lower income households had worse quality mammograms and were presented with later stage disease or were diagnosed with later stage disease. In addition, Low resource institutions may rely more on general radiologists. Um, 
One study by Elmo and colleagues found that fellowship training was the only variable associated with improved accuracy in mammography interpretation. And so, you know, fellowship trained mammographers tend to work at academic institutions and minority patients tend not to frequent academic institutions. So we can see how this disparity can be perpetuated because of this. Some authors actually believe that, you know, there's parity between utilization rates between both groups currently, but the disparity is being driven mainly by inadequate follow-up of abnormal mammograms. And of course, this will be associated with higher likelihood of diagnosis of advanced breast cancer. In fact, the time between abnormal mammogram and biopsy is longer in facilities serving a high proportion of minorities. And that's due to several factors, as you could imagine, you know, fewer resources, fewer radiologists, longer wait times for biopsy appointments, um, less direct communication as, as facilities that have, um, that have shorter follow-up times. And also um, in the general public, there tends to be a lack of awareness of the availability of, of certain screening examinations for breast cancer or lung cancer screening or even colon cancer. And this may be, and then also the impact of low income and lack of health insurance. So we can see by applying this model, there's several holes in the various levels here, or several deficiencies in, this, in the various levels here that can produce the poor outcomes that we see in our patient, in patient populations. So the challenge for us as radiologists, as physicians in general, as a medical community, is to try to shrink these holes or even eliminate them altogether by working with our institutions and working with the patients, working with communities, and working with, um, with um, other providers. So some patient level interventions. I would encourage radiologists to really, again, extend your vision beyond the reading room and develop relationships with the community board, with ambulatory and primary care, get involved in outreach and education efforts to improve health literacy, particularly in conditions that disproportionately affect um, the, the communities in which you serve. There should also be a concerted effort to decrease the risk of missing appointments. And even though we cannot do this unilaterally, none of this we can do unilaterally. If ever there's an effort by your institution to assess and address social determinants of health, radiology needs to be a part of that conversation. So one of the ways that we can decrease the risk of missing appointments is on the systems level by bundling screening appointments. So if a patient comes in for a pelvic um, a annual GYN visit, maybe she can also have her mammogram done at the same time and lung cancer screening if she's a smoker. We as departments need to offer more off hours imaging and extend our service hours. We never want patients to have to choose between their income and their health. Um, this is a particularly challenging for safety net hospitals, but we still try to prioritize new technologies and to hire and retain skilled radiologists and technologists. And when there are abnormal findings, I would, um, I, you know, I would, would advocate for trying to make sure that that communication loop is as tight as possible. Direct telephone communication works best in certain communities. There's one study by Nguyen et al. that found that with telephone communication, patients were more likely to return for um, follow-up Im imaging within 60 days. At the provider level, there's definite in, uh, need to increase the diversity within medicine in general and radiology specifically. If I'm not mistaken, I think we're the least diverse of all the specialties. So there's a lot of work yet to be done there. We need to ensure that our, our clinician and provider colleagues are informed and knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about screening recommendations. And within our departments and among radiologists, we need to keep abreast of new technologies and techniques that could benefit our patient. And again, extend yourself beyond the reading room, work with your colleagues to curb inappropriate um, imaging use. And also using quality and performance improvement efforts, we can try to address some of the efficiency issues that we're having, particularly when it comes to patient waiting. So as you can see, if we can work with our patients, work with our communities, work within our system, work with our providers, we can try to shrink or even eliminate some of these holes with the intention of decreasing the significant loss that um, our patients and their families suffer when, when they are um, when they're diagnosed with some of these diseases in an, in an advanced stage when they cannot be helped. So this is a very quick presentation. I hope I didn't go too fast. And I want to thank everyone for their attention. And here's my contact information if anyone wants to reach me. Thank you very much.
Hello, uh, my name is Gail Morgan, and I want to thank the RLI for this opportunity to talk about what we as radiologists and specifically our ACR chapters can do to get involved. I have no conflicts of interest. Part of what we want to do really quickly is I will review the background, the history of ACR's commitment to diversity and discuss the development of ACR chapter diversity committees, a little bit about how to create one, look at the case for addressing disparities in health and healthcare, acknowledge, as you've heard, the existence of inequities in radiology, and explore what you and ACR chapters can do. Well, questions to ask along the way. We wanna ask ourselves, what is the case for examining health disparities? Why does it matter? Why does it matter to us? What are areas of disparity that we can identify in radiology? And what are some of the strategies that we can utilize? How can we empower ourselves? And of course, just a little bit of background. ACR was a little bit on the cutting edge of this back in 2012. Uh, Paul Ellenbogen, then president, um, presented in his address to the ACR Council, the announcement that the Commission for Women and Diversity was created. They would have two committees, Committee for Women, Committee for General Diversity, now the Committee for Diversity and Inclusion. And the Commission set out and formed its own strategic plan in 2014 with a vision that we would celebrate diversity and actively promote inclusion at all levels of training, practice, and leadership. And embedded within the mission, as you can see, is the concept of equity, access, and innovation, not only for our benefit as radiologists and as a profession, but also for patients and the communities that we serve. ACR strategic plan of 2014 then set that under membership and member engagement, it would be important to grow and retain membership by fostering meaningful engagement. And one of the objectives there was to increase diversity and inclusion in our profession. The ACR Council Resolution 14 was then adopted that basically said, the future of radiology will be enhanced, will depend upon increasing diversity and representation, including in our workforce. But by doing so, we would be better positioned to address health inequities in an increasingly diverse population. I won't go into this in detail, but there are four basic steps that we outlined in the blueprint of how to create a committee. If you haven't done already in your state chapter, I'd encourage you to look at the commission website and um, look at the blueprint document that is there. It has embedded within it a bylaws template also, which you can use uh, in your organization. So some of the early work that we did, we published in the JACR, uh, Dr. Johnson Lightfoot and several other uh, of uh, co-authors, including myself, a part one and a part two uh, series. Part one was basically saying, why is this issue important in radiation and radiation oncology? Part two basically we set up to say, what are barriers and challenges and what are specific recommendations we can make to the Board of Chancellors on how to approach uh, improving this in our, in our organization. So we looked at the fact that in diagnostic radiology, women, for example, although comprising slightly over half of the population in the census, and nearly that amount among medical school graduates, that that number plummeted when it came to uh, applicants into radiology residency and radiologists practicing and in faculty. And a very similar story was also true for underrepresented minorities, although comprising 16% roughly of the population, that their representation among medical graduates, although cut by more than half, plummeted even further in diagnostic radiology. And we also see the breakdown of Hispanic, uh, Asian, Pacific Islanders, and African Americans. In radiation oncology, a similar story, you can see the drop off, uh, significant drop off into the profession. And so when we looked at over a, a long time span, uh, representation among um, multiple specialties and residency programs, we saw that we were in the bottom four. So if you look at this graph, uh, radiation oncology represents the lower red line, uh, radiology is right above that, uh, that red line. And so somehow other specialties were able to attract um, underrepresented minorities and females for that matter more into their specialties than into ours. So we wanted to know what explained that specialty gap. So this narrow pipeline 
although it starts with coming out of coming into medical school, uh, is disproportionately even lower with graduates out of medical school who are attracted to our profession. And that narrow pipeline limits our ability to diversify our workforce, uh, diversify our faculties, and um, to recruit diversity into our uh, ACR leadership pipeline. So what's the case for disparities? Well, we all know the Sentinel uh, report from the Institute of Medicine in 2002, that basic, basically uh, reported that health disparities exist and they are indeed associated with worse clinical outcomes due to a multiplicity of reasons, uh, many of which the sources are physicians and uh, managers in healthcare, as well as the patients, certainly conscious and implicit bias stereotyping plays a role, attitudes and behavior, what you expect of a patient or physician interplays. And this all occurs in a longstanding, a broad uh, field of social inequity. This was the rub. When the Kaiser Family Foundation took a survey of physicians, what it found is that the majority of physicians did not really believe that disparities uh, existed because of differences among uh, populations of different characteristics. Most of them believe that insurance coverage was the main problem. Um, and so this, this was the first problem is that we are not aware that health disparities existed. Um, then with the further breakdown, I'm not sure in the graphs here, physicians of different ethnic backgrounds, of course, believed uh, that there were differences, uh, disparities due to differences among various populations. And so did women. Women also thought that minorities were not paid enough attention to in terms of medical research. We see these definitions just to review them. We see this uh, lovely image on the right explaining equality and equity, the difference in terms. Equality implies sameness, uh, that everyone gets the same thing to promote uh, justice and fairness. But the assumption is that everyone has the same starting line. They start off from the same place. Equity implies fairness, that you can have the same access to opportunity. We just have to make some adjustments to make sure that you can uh, uh, compensate for where you start from. And the assumption there is that there are no barriers to your participation. Inequities, as defined by the CDC, disparities that are systematic and therefore avoidable and unjust. And those, I think, are the low-hanging fruit where we can uh, definitely um, wage an attack. Social determinants of health, uh, uh, Dr. Scott has gone through um, a lot of that, so I don't have to repeat it, but this schematic just shows that, unfortunately, our reality is many start in the hole, uh, way behind due to uh, factors beyond their control, where they're born, what zip code they live in, uh, geographical uh, disparities, um, how they learn, what education uh, they can afford uh, the, for themselves or be afforded of. Um, if they're employed, where they work, what the environment's like, um, and um, what those working conditions are, age, et cetera. So social determinants can, can really affect your lifelong health and well-being. So we are just, I think, recently awakening, especially compared to other medical specialties, we're a little bit late coming to the game here, uh, to an understanding that healthcare disparities exist and that they exist in medical imaging. And we're just beginning to understand how differential access and utilization of medical imaging services impact people, which means we are at the start of a great exploration of what our potential is and how we can play a pivotal role in helping to address these inequities. So like many have said before me, we need to come out of our dark rooms and we can make a significant difference, come out and improve our vision. Early on, I was surprised to find that Richard Gundeman had written in 2007 um, an article about radiology's uh, awakening basically to addressing uh, racial and ethnic disparities. And he talked about uh, some of the same things that were just reviewed about the factors, social determinants that happen before a patient ever reaches a care facility, um, their household income, uh, whether they live in a safe environment housing-wise, whether they have environmental challenges, 
um, clean air, water, parks, uh, basic things that we take for granted. And then also other barriers of access to care, actual care and care delivery uh, levels, uh, which Dr. Scott has just reviewed, uh, including uh, cultural differences, language barriers, and um, uh, financial toxicity, financial burdens, and other things that we may not be aware that challenge a patient. And I think sometimes we make an assumption that patients are not necessarily compliant with uh, what our results are, what our recommendations are, when a patient actually may be attempting to be compliant, but there are other barriers that, that uh, lead to avoidance of care. Uh, this is an uh, article that I would highly recommend, uh, which is an introduction to health disparities for the practicing radiologist uh, by Safdar. And in this article, um, he talks about the fact that these imaging disparities do exist. And I've listed some of the ones on the right that we found over screening mammography uh, and lung cancer screening procedures, including IR, all through the stroke. Uh, intervention and care spectrum, even in ER radiology ordering patterns where uh, different exams are ordered at different thresholds uh, for certain racial and ethnic minorities or in uh, rural environments, for example, other underserved um, communities. I would add to this list also colorectal uh, screening. This article uh, printed in September, I think gives a very comprehensive overview of many of the things that uh, Dr. Scott has just presented with her uh, patient walking through the process example of um, how breast cancer screening recommendations um, can hold American, African-American women at a disadvantage uh, in achieving care and the higher mortality rate uh, versus a similar incidence rate for breast cancer of African-Americans versus um, whites. And so uh, this article really goes over a lot of a lot of factors, including not just tumor biology, but the fact that, for example, there's an increased um, uh, incidence of genetic mutations uh, among African Americans compared to the general population that I think many of us are unaware of. And the fact that perhaps genetic screening should start in an earlier age among this population. So this article basically uh, discusses uh, a rationale for a strong recommendation for annual screening for African-American women and consider them inherently as a high-risk population. Drivers, again, of long-term dis disparities for African-American women are many. On the left side, as we said, less often recommended by their primary care physicians and their screening mammography and appropriate interval, appropriate age. Um, when they do have uh, mammography, there are other issues in terms of access, socioeconomic factors. And then when they are treated, they're often presented with non-concordant uh, treatment guidelines. Now, on the right side of this slide, I think this is where many of these things are directly under our purview as radiologists. We can educate uh, women and physicians and other healthcare providers about the risk of breast cancer in this population. We can educate people about the rates of utilization of screening mammography and the, all the things that Dr. Scott just reviewed about longer intervals between mammogram exams to diagnostic workups, then to biopsy, then to treatment recommendations. And so these really exacerbate uh, the disparities. The COVID-19 pandemic has only spotlighted uh, these inequities and gaps in care. And in fact, um, we recently have evidence that even screening mammography rates fell off disproportionately for uh, African-Americans and Hispanics compared to whites during the period of time of the pandemic. And so I think this gives us a chance to uh, look at where inequities exist in radiology in our profession. We're at a unique uh, opportunity um, in terms of the time that we live in. Uh, considering the emphasis uh, on accounting for these disparities uh, in the recent movement for uh, social justice. So radiology has a unique opportunity and uh, Dr. McGinty mentioned this earlier, because imaging is at the uh, central point of clinical care spectrum, we are in a key position to help uh, address uh, inequities. We're involved through much of the care cycle, depending at the time of diagnosis, 
uh, time of intervention and management and practices uh, during the times of encounters with patients at the times of, of imaging entry points have an opportunity to uh, do things like bundle screening exams, uh, capture patients more efficiently for uh, follow-up workup, perhaps maybe even on the same day, um, assess whether there are other factors for that patient, um, if there's a genetic history that needs to be uh, explored, if there are financial uh, concerns and anxiety, transportation issues, childcare issues, a uh, lot of things which can um, help to mitigate the patient's uh, avoidance of care. And, and in this article, I'd like to say there's four ways that I love the schematic that um, it talks about ways to promote health equity. And I think these are uh, a map really for radiologists and for um, ACR chapters. Education. Here we are in a unique position because we know more than other specialties about disparities in screening. We need to disseminate that information. I always refer to physicians, but among radiologists, many of whom are not aware, and all along the training spectrum from medical students up through residency and fellows. And there's not been a core curriculum that really addresses health disparities, and particularly in imaging. And that is an area that we need to work on. Diversity and inclusion efforts, incorporating the radiology departments we talked about, as well as in your chapter activities and in your practices, promote diversity of your leadership uh, pipeline and of your workforce. Disparities research, I won't go into that very much, but certainly we've talked about partnering with other organizations. Advocacy. We as an organization are about advocacy. Uh, we need to advocate more for vulnerable populations and including their ability to access um, imaging services in order to reduce disparities. We can advocate to the public in terms of educating them and also to legislators. Now, strategies call to action with this as I call the generic blueprint for our chapters to get involved. Some of the things you can do, form a task force in your state chapter to address an area of health disparity or disparities in radiology. All politics is local. Wherever you live, your population, be it rural or minority population, or whether you're dealing with di disabilities, uh, transgender, um, discrimination, you need to, to get involved in, and look at these issues. Facilitate education. Um, you can, for example, start a newsletter or have an area on your uh, chapter website that's geared to educating patients and referring physicians, an easy place that they can go to uh, be updated about current guidelines, um, for example. And uh, I think this is also good branding for the ACR for your chapter to disseminate the fact that people can go to your website and access information that's easy to use. Forge coalitions, we've addressed that within your institution and uh, regionally among organizations. And then do community outreach. There are many community organizations that we have sort of been in a silo as a profession and unaware of that uh, can facilitate and accelerate uh, our progress in addressing disparities. And engage, as I said, advocate for the needs of your patients. For example, if you do not have Medicaid expansion uh, in your state, this may be an area that you wanna look at well, that will help your patients. I just wanted to put this example up that I, I thought was pretty exemplary. Um, I adapted it from the Washington State Radiological Society is a breast disparities initiative. And I won't go through all of the areas, but you can see what they wrote out, the top four categories about what they wanted to do. Identify barriers. This, this again is going back to the um, mammography uh, example that was referred to earlier. And commit to having women having screen at the appropriate age. What do you have to do to do that? You have to educate your physicians and providers and your radiologists that this should be annual, not every other year, not almost three years, okay, when they're late. Uh, develop patient navigation systems in your institution and help to propagate them at other institutions to ensure that people are promptly evaluated and those loss encounters uh, and loss follow-up uh, are minimized. 
identify barriers uh, with your patients. Uh, navigators again can help patients with administrative red tape so they spend uh, less time uh, doing that than, than seeing a physician. Develop systems that ensure the whole chain uh, is shortened to biopsy time, for example. And I added this one at the bottom, which is engage in collaborative efforts with your local medical organizations. It could be the OBGYNs or your local chapter of the AMA, uh, community outreach and partnerships. There are many organizations out in the community that are trying to do work uh, in the same area of health equity, uh, some civic organizations, for example, and perhaps those uh, efforts can be facilitated when we're involved. And I just wanted to include this photo. I love this. This is from uh, Alice, our friend Alice in Wonderland. And uh, as Alice looked across the long chessboard uh, that she had to traverse to get home, this I think can remind us that that uh, these health inequities didn't evolve overnight. And there's a long journey to health equity, but the road is worth traveling. I wanted to leave you with these two last uh, sentinel quotes. One that's well known from Martin Luther King about uh, the forms of inequality and the injustice in healthcare is the most shocking. And then this inspirational quote, which I think it really is our charge in radiology from Congressman John Lewis. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? Thank you. Good evening to all of you. And I wanna thank the uh, organizers for both the invitation and the very kind introduction. And I want to thank uh, Dr. McGinty for not only teeing things up so beautifully this evening, but for launching the call to commit during her presidential address. And to quote her, which I love to do, health equity is certainly in our lane. And I want to thank my co-presenters, Dr. Janelle Scott and Dr. Gail Morgan. Much of what I have to say will sound as though I'm echoing their very wise words, and I certainly hope to do so. Okay, it's not advancing there. The disclosures that are pertinent to this presentation have to do with my work at the AMA because I will mention ongoing work there and my work on foundation boards. And when we look at what creates health, as both Dr. Scott and Dr. Morgan reminded us, way before we weigh in, there are social inequities, institutional inequities, living conditions, and at-risk behavior way before we weigh in, in many cases, way too late to really have an effect. And if you look at the upstream uh, factors, the midstream factors and the downstream factors of determinations of health, they prescribe what is needed at the societal level. For example, pro-equity policies, housing and environments that are affordable and healthy, safe neighborhoods at the community level, good paying jobs and quality education, physical activity, access to both transportation and healthcare. And then at the individual and family level, factors like low birth weight, mental illness, homelessness, obesity, really determine what, de what makes health and what creates disparities in health. I want everyone to notice because of the emphasis but that both prior speakers placed on community, look at the central role that the community level plays interacting with both the societal and family levels. And when we speak about many of the issues, okay. This is not advancing and not happy. 
Uh, Jen, I might stop screen sharing given the issues that. Okay, it's advancing again. Uh, given the determinants at many of those levels, uh, I want to emphasize the alignment with many of the activities and Dr. Morgan uh, emphasized our strategic goal. And in its last version, we talk about the importance of payment policies and practice models, patient-centered care, our external relationships, innovation in research, data science, and certainly member engagement. And each one of those matters when it comes to health equity. And Dr. Morgan just emphasized our central role in healthcare from leading in high quality imaging care, in screening, diagnosis, treatment, planning, and treatment delivery, and then in monitoring patients. So it is very much in radiology's lane and there is low hanging fruit for radiology to truly make a difference. And for example, in IR deserts, interventional radiology deserts, black Americans with diabetes are three times more likely to lose a limb to amputation than others. Or considering the impact of breast cancer and mortality, in minority populations. 39% of the population without health insurance had a mammogram in the past two years and compare that to 75% of insured patients. And a third example, the lung cancer outcome disparities, especially among women, black men, and those in rural areas. So 23% of the United States population lives in rural areas and 22% of rural Americans live within a half an hour of lung cancer screening centers, whereas over 80% of urban residents live in that proximity. There's a lot for us to do and a big difference that we can make. And before leading this discussion, I want to remind you that Dr. McGinty stressed the business case for uh, health equity. If it is true, and many studies demonstrate that it is, that 80% of healthcare dollars are spent on chronic disease, then consider the fact that heart disease and stroke mortality rates are significantly higher and life expectancy much lower in rural areas. So our specific opportunities, uh, Dr. Morgan addressed, uh, we need to address the disparities and measurably change the outcomes that we can have and that we can create so that individual statistics can be registered quite literally in registries and create a path forward, a template for population health management. Identify the gaps in care, collect and disseminate resources, initiatives, and best practices. Collaborate on programs and services, empowering our members to act. And something the ACR has done well for a long time, and that's advocate for patients, connect with patients and community members. So we take a, a page out of Arthur Ashe's playbook and say, start where you are, use what you have and do what you can. And that's just what ACR is trying to do in convening a health equity coalition. And how did we go about that? Well, again, you've just seen this graphic from uh, Dr. Morgan, but in Dr. Safdar's article, he stresses the importance of education, fostering diversity, research disparities, and of course, advocacy. And I'm very proud that in radiology, both the T-MIST trial, where just about 20% of enrollees are African-American, compare that 
to the national average for research cohorts with 8% African Americans. And our new idea study that has uh, almost 4,000 of the 7,000 patients already enrolled uh, coming from Latino uh, and Black populations. So moving with this as a template, Dr. McGinty urged us all in her president's address, and this is what the page looks like, that you can get to by going to this web address and you can pledge, you can commit to advance health equity in practice. And the press release that followed uh, highlighted this huge effort. And I'm gonna give you some numbers in a little bit. The progress that ACR has been able to support to date is to promise staff and infrastructure budget through 2022 as we convene the coalition. We're developing the website and a resource guide platform using Confluence and Smartsheet. And we've engaged Forbes Tape, a uh, firm that the ACR has a long relationship with as a neutral advisor with a positive track record of bipartisan success in launching initiatives and successful coalitions. Our ACR marketing is beginning to explore logo and branding, not under ACR's advisement, but under our mobilization team. And you're, I'm going to describe that for you next. And then lastly, just as we have a resource toolkit for our patient and family-centered care uh, efforts, we should be able to assemble a health equity resources toolkit. So as convener of the coalition, we are focusing on a network of patient-centered radiologists. The mobilization team members at the core of this initiative are, in addition to the ACR, our American Board of Radiology, who recognize the importance of addressing this as part of our professional responsibility. We're even twisting their arms to consider part four, uh, continuing certification uh, credits for participating in this important uh, effort. The ARRS, the AUR, the RSNA, thank you, Dr. Janelle Scott, for being RSNA's representative to the mobilization team. And then the Society of Chairs of Radiology Departments and SIR. More recently, we've engaged commitment from both the radiology section councils of the National Medical Association. And just this week, with the meeting officially ending today, the Radiology Section Council of the American Medical Association. And that last bullet is not empty by mistake. It's for all of you to engage your specialty societies so that a ripple effect can emanate from this critical core. And this is because nobody is going to own this. Everybody needs to own this. So the tasks that we gave to this mobilization team, consisting of a member from the uh, founding organizations that I just mentioned, is to develop a coalition pledge and principles. Think of the pledges that we do every year for Image Wisely and Image Gently. To canvas the very ver various resources and efforts already underway, we don't need to duplicate effort. We just need to collaborate and uh, achieve our goal by combined efforts, identified goals, and an operational action plan. The effort, the coalition, will require a governance structure and some plan for cost-shared sustainability. But I'm proud that the ACR has made the initial investment and gotten us off the ground. 
We've already uh, created a draft of a statement of purpose and model PR communication for membership organizations to use. The feedback on those are, is due tomorrow, so I don't have a final version yet, but the mobilization team is hard at work. They are engaging with the National Association of Community Health Centers and exploring avenues to engage the federally qual qualified health centers as well so that we really get into those rural areas that need uh, these issues addressed. Again, the toolkit being developed, and I'm so proud of the collaboration so far. We have three of our team members, uh, ACR through the Health Policy Institute, RSNA and SIR, building a directory of radiology services disparity. Again, identifying the gaps and then to additional organizations, the AUR and SCAR uh, plan an academic societies survey so that our efforts can be multiplied. Well, here's the early impact. ACR has been quoted or cited in 32 articles on health equity, reaching 89 million readers. And you can read the various uh, publications for yourself. Equivalent advertising would cost $187,000. So folks, this is earned, pressed, because it's deserved. Ongoing social media, posts, impressions, engagements, and link clicks. Resources need to be assembled and communicated, and we're doing just that. Again, I'll, I'll say it probably only four more times, the uh, website, the link for the landing page where you can commit to act. Tonight's effort, I'm very proud of, and again, thank everyone for participating. And the various blogs, we're hoping for a JACR article collection uh, and a podcast. Thank you, Amy Patel and uh, others listed. The outreach has been to state chapters. I'm so proud that the New York State Radiological Society was the first to uh, voice support for this, and they will commit through their newly established, it's just about a year old, uh, foundation. We've asked the various commission chairs uh, on the Board of Chancellors to reach out to the radiology specialty societies and we already have commitment from SABI and SAR. Uh, through our inter-society uh, membership, where it will be important, again, not to duplicate efforts, but leverage this unique expertise and the core competencies of each radiology organization. A academic institutions will follow uh, in our outreach as well as corporate and private practices. And of course, funders, both public in the foundation sector and private sectors. This is a snapshot of the various organizations subscribing to the Inter-Society Conference on the website that they've used, Radiology Central. This could be a, 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 a very effective um, way of expanding and multiplying our efforts. I'm very proud of the collaboration we've had already with the ACE, between the ACR and the AMA when in September of 2020 we launched this webinar and folks there's CME still available through October of 2022 and again this is a screenshot from the ACR catalog on the ACR's website, uh, an hour and a half of CME credit available. And we had the stars who have been such great spokespeople, including representatives from the uh, patient sphere, as well as uh, the AMA, in addition to our radiology leaders. In last month's issue of the bulletin, our board chair quoted, 
This is about our moral obligation as physicians and radiologists. This is about standing up for our patients and their individual needs, a significant opportunity to declare, and it's a full-time job keeping track of Dr. Fleischan as his vice chair, but I have to edit, not only declare, but demonstrate that radiology can make a difference and we will make a difference. And importantly, I think that Dr. Scott and Morgan both highlighted the divisiveness in our politics, in our public at the present time. But for the ACR, the goal to strive toward health equity should not and will not be about those politics not partisan and not identity politics. We need to put patients before politics. And I'm glad that Dr. Morgan quoted Dr. Luther, uh, Martin Luther King because I intended to do the same exact thing. It is always the right time to do what is right. And both prior speakers has, um, have emphasized that the time is truly now. So in looking ahead, and making, taking steps forward for this coalition and its action items, I invite each and all of you to join us in the next steps. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to a lively discussion, particularly if it's being moderated by Dr. Hirsch. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. That was just absolutely incredible. I mean, I think all the audience members have been blown away by the uh, different presentations as I invite the speakers along with Jen Nathan to come uh, onto the screen. Well, as you said, questions have been flowing fast and furious, but I uh, wanted to take one quick second to, to make the point that this originally started as a Future Trends webinar. Future Trends is a, a subcommittee of the Economics Commission, and uh, it was our view that tackling disparities on the way the ACR is, is doing, uh, taking leadership for so many years and looking forward uh, taking leadership is critical to the economic future and footprint of us as a specialty, as well as frankly, the broader community as we think about health equity. So that's uh, my personal involvement uh, with this webinar. Um, I, would, I would ask that people continue to put questions into the QA box not not sure we're going to be able to get through everyone because we do commit to being done by uh, 8 30 and so we'll probably stop taking uh questions at around 8 27. um so jen and i have been trying to divide up the questions for the different uh speakers it's an imperfect science and we would invite any of the other speakers after we ask a question to uh to 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 speak up uh if if they have additional thoughts the first three questions uh, uh, I would put to Janelle. Um, Janelle, a lot of a lot of the questions uh, had to do with how we could do more in underserved communities to close the gap on health uh, disparities. Your uh, bio, your life, talks about working in safety net hospitals. Give us some guidance. What can we do? I think the first thing that we should be willing to do is to work in communities that have safety net hospitals. Um, you know, I understand that um, there are some challenges to working in an environment such as I work in. It is it's significantly resource constrained. Um, and so it, it can be day to day, can be challenging. Um, but it's important because I what I think these hospitals need more than ever are cohorts of physicians who really want to make a difference, who are skilled at what they do, they're well-trained and they're dedicated, and that makes a huge difference. Um, and also people who are willing to work with communities, willing to step out of the reading room and get involved with, with the physicians who um, actually interact with patients more than we do. I am always walking around the hospitals, speaking to, I mean, I'm, I'm really proud of Kings County because we're launching finally after several years, a lung cancer screening program. And, it's a huge deal because it was a huge undertaking. 
And um, it required, it took a lot. It took a lot to bring it to a, a, a community. But, um, but just the fact that as, as radiologists there, we advocated and we did not give up. We pushed and we pushed until we finally got the service for a community. Um, and it's, it's, it's good, but it's also sad because we we're like three weeks um, up and we found so many, you know, suspicious lesions already. It's, it's quite, everyone's kind of a little bit sad about it because we were like, wow, it's amazing. And um, because of the outreach that we have done with the primary care physicians, with ambulatory and, and even with direct patient interaction with Facebook lives and working with our communications departments to really reach the patients, you have patients coming and calling us and saying, oh, I heard about this lung cancer screening thing. Can I, where can I sign up? So it's really important to get really at the grassroots level. But I think the first, and I think I'm bearing off the, in the, the original question. Um, <laughs> I think the most important thing is to get involved. Don't be, don't, you know, don't rule out an institution and come there with all your passion, with your expertise and come ready to make a difference. And, and you can. No, that's prophetic. It's never too late to get involved. It's never too late to try to correct uh, a problem. Geraldine McGinty, a great friend of mine, uh, has in many ways led the way. Geraldine, I think uh, you were one of the people that thought about the pledge. Any sense of how many people have taken it so far? I don't have the number right now. Um, I know we were in the hundreds right after the annual meeting. So there's a lot of energy about this and I've gotten a lot of emails from people. How can I get involved? I hope what you saw this evening is certainly what I, I echo what Janelle says in terms of what we do every day in our practice, but what Gail has done around state chapter engagement. And um, there is definitely, there are definitely gonna be many more opportunities to participate in future. So yeah, a lot of energy around this. That's terrific. I put this one to Gail and to Jackie, um, uh, because I think, Gail, you began to address this, and Jackie, your work at the AMA is so well known. Uh, how do we engage other physician groups to work alongside radiologists that are interested in order to advance this agenda? Gail is unmuted. Why don't you go first? Sure. Um, well, I think so one of the things we have to do first is, is increase the engagement among ourselves um, as radiologists in, in our chapters. Um, we need to be very intentional and deliberate about it because it's not going to happen by osmosis. And I think if we accept that and we start uh, deliberately incorporating uh, outreach, educational outreach, even starting within the chapters and the membership by committing to including it in your annual meetings or your quarterly meetings, that you'll have diversity lectures, that you'll have newsletter columns, that you'll have diversity committees. Um, and then you can um, expound upon that and reach out to your local chapters of AMA or GYN or whatever. They, they really want help. For example, when I was in Washington State before, we had the breast density legislation issue arise. And of course, now we have uh, inequities in breast cancer care as an example. And physicians wanted us to help them educate their patients and their practices about these issues. They're very happy to have our expertise, one, because we are the experts. Uh, and secondly, it's, it's an increased demand upon their clinical time for them to do some of these things that we can do. So I would say, um, reach out, uh, and I'm talking now to chapters locally and involve your people at the state level, and uh, including in your legislative uh, lobbying, if you have to lobby, make friends with those who have common ground with you on these issues of inequ around inequity. Thank you, Gail Jackie. Thank you for that question. And um, I'm loaded for bear, Josh. <laughs> so, uh, again, we play a central role. There is no specialty that we don't touch. Uh, there is no imaging modality that isn't important to both medical practitioners and surgical practitioners. And if we put ourselves out there, my favorite idea, and I think Geraldine is so tired of hearing me say this, but when we hit the disease of the months, namely October being breast cancer month, 
I know practices have been hit hard by COVID, but tell me what practice can't afford. Tell me a number, two, three, five, free mammograms over weekends in October. Uh, four, community clinics where patients don't have access to screening or a referral place to send these uninsured sometimes patients to. And we also are very lucky that our trainees are so excited about this. And it's not just within our specialties. And if anyone can network better than Geraldine McGinty can, it's that group of, I tease them, I call them the young and the restless who create such a buzz and they, they network beautifully. And I will, because I have disclosed it, uh, I stepped down today as president of the AMA Foundation, but I have two more years left on the board and I am their representative to the LGBTQ Commission establishing the very first in this nation fellowship so that that marginalized pop population has healthcare providers who know their issues. And in radiology, they are very specific issues. At the Lenox Hill Clinic downtown, a former Montefiore resident, we had her back last year to give grand rounds, Dr. Kavita Patel is dedicated to the radiology specifics of transgender care. We don't need to be calling abscesses when these are flaps that have been created for gender affirming surgery. And we don't need to put trans patients into powder pink mammogram rooms waiting for a screening mammography where they are not comfortable. So there are many things keeping the trans population in particular away from healthcare. And we can dive in, in our various screening programs and open those doors. And that's another connection I plan to make between the AMA Foundation and our efforts. And then lastly, I hope Dr. Thorworth is still on, uh, our very own CEO. It's not often that somebody on the board gets to you know, tell the uh, CEOs of the organization what to do, but he sits on the board of the, of the Council on Medical Specialty Societies and talk about roping in other specialties, not only through the AMA, but through groups that may not overlap with AMA membership. Like I said, uh, we'll get this done. We just need all of your energy behind us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. You're a true force of nature in every sense of the word. I'm amazed at the amazing, well, I'm amazed at the amazing things. I'm amazed at the things you can do. Let's pivot to Geraldine. And I'm gonna just, at this point, recognizing the time, there are so many questions coming in. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. I think at this point, I would ask that uh, no more questions be submitted. Geraldine, you work at a renowned uh, hospital and uh, putting together one or two questions. Um, what could non-safety net hospitals or uh, successful practices do to use their resources to advance this agenda? Wow, that is a really great question. And I'll, I'll, I'll use it to sort of pull out some of the questions about how we um, engage with medical students and residents. And as a medical school where we're educating the next generation of doctors and a training program where we're educating the next generation of radiologists, we are we are really um, tasked, I think, with, with committing to those goals around a more diverse workforce as, as a start. That's, you know, that that's clearly important. Um, you know, there's no doubt that, you know, I come from, you know, my primary practice is in an area that's very well resourced. Now we have um, affiliations in Brooklyn and Queens, and we are honestly really starting to, you know, open our eyes to the gaps in care 
the way in which access to care looks very different in certain parts of our, our network. So I think really just, just having those, as Janelle said, uncomfortable conversations about the fact that maybe, you know, we have work to do to make sure that the same level of care is provided across our entire system. But I'm going to focus on the training piece of it. You know, right now we're about to start our next generation of peer scholars. I know Johnson Lightfoot is on. That's something that a lot of academic institutions have committed to, to support medical students after their first year, exposing them to radiology as a career. I think that's that's a great starting place for us in academics. Fantastic answer, uh, Geraldine. My admiration uh, for, for you equals my admiration for uh, Jackie. You've managed to get so many things done in so little time. Pivoting to Janelle, we're getting uh, tons of questions around uh, training. And uh, Geraldine just referenced that. I wanna go down one specific uh, element of it, though, because I think it really dovetails nicely with your presentation. How do we get trainees, medical students, residents, fellows more involved in the question of not uh, uh, participation in specialty, but health equity, making sure that the patients we serve are served uh, with equity and equally? I think the first thing that we have to do is to model the behavior as attendings. And I try to do that every day. I think. Um, it's very easy as radiologists to, I mean, to not understand that they're real, they're human beings with families behind these images. And so I encourage my, my residents to understand the whole patient for one. I personally believe that quality and performance improvement is, is training in those areas are key because I, in, in the safety net system that I work in, we are not resourced very well. I can't just hire someone to do, you know, to fill in the gaps. So it means that we have to be very creative. And that means involving my residents in looking at gaps in care and looking at how we can best um, address some of these gaps in care, be it patient experience. I mean, we, we deal with things such as, um, you know, proper lockers for patients to store their clothes while they get a mammogram. We deal with issues such as, you know, a mammogram is down and patients have to, they call the assessor, right? And, and, you know, so there's so many things that we have to deal with. And I bring my residents along for the ride because I need them to understand that we are part of the entire imaging cycle, not just the interpretation part of it. And let us be creative together and solve some of these problems. So that's, that's what I'm doing. And, I, and they see me work with other specialties. Like with, um, I work recently, my project working with stroke improving our, our stroke turnaround time for, for non-contrast CTs. Um, and that was an effort that required input from neurology and emergency medicine. I, wrote, I brought my residents into that so they can understand why it's important, you know, and to understand the impact that we can make on a community by, get, by imaging quickly, efficiently, accurately, and, and giving our reports that way. So I think we have to, more, most importantly, other than mandating it, we have to model it because Residents are really focused on just being good radiologists and they don't necessarily want to deal with everything else. But if as attendings, we, we tell them, I listen, radiology is more than just reading studies. Radiology is about making our patients are taken care of throughout the entire imaging cycle. I think that we, that, that they would, they, and they do, my residents do appreciate that. And better yet, when they leave my institution, I would hope that they will take those attitudes with them wherever they go, wherever they practice. Oh my God, there were so many Dr. Scott quotables in that. Let's get together and solve some problems. Be me by favorite. And I'm tweeting right now as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, that, that's easy to believe, Geraldine. The 14,000 followers are waiting. To those whose questions we didn't get to, Jen and I apologize. You know, with, with uh, presentations like this, it's not surprising. We were deluged. I want to thank uh, the ACR for, for hosting uh, this webinar and uh, more importantly, for taking such leadership. I want to thank our speakers, Dr. Bellow, Dr. McGinty, Dr. Morgan, uh, Dr. Scott, just, just incredible. With that, myself and Jen, we want to thank you, and we're going to pass it off to Bob Pyatt. With that, I say good night. What a tremendous program. Fantastic program this evening. Thank you to all the faculty. So please share your feedback with us. We will be sending out a post webinar survey and the recording of tonight's program next week. Please feel free to share the recording 
with your colleagues and get the message out. The next power hour topic will be in August. We're going to have a program on hospital mergers and consolidating and merging radiology practices. This will be on Wednesday, August 25 at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Please register for this and or other free RLI Power Hour webinars at www.acr.org slash Power Hour. Again, thanks to our faculty for a tremendous program tonight. Good night, everyone.